we're going through this uh, where we're, de- we're going through the Apostles' Creed, which a creed is a declaration, a statement of this is what we believe. And one of the things that I'm sure all of us in some way have discovered about our faith is that it's not only important that we just recite songs that are up on a screen, we come to church and we nod our head because I'm always right, and we just go along with, go through the motions and go through the routine, but that we understand what we believe and why we believe it. Because there's gonna be times in our lives, whether it's just in culture, whether it's with unbelieving friends or coworkers, whether it's a professor in college or a teacher in high school or junior high, that somebody is gonna go, why do you believe that? And then we don't just go through the motions of going, uh, Jesus, right? It's kind of the, my answer for everything. But that we understand this is what we believe. And some of the modern day creeds are worship songs where we make declarations of this is what I believe. This is why I believe it. Or God, I'm, I believe that you will fulfill this in my life or that you will be who you promised to be in this area of my life. And so I'm gonna cry out to you and I'm gonna declare my faith in you. And so we've been going through the, the Apostles' Creed and we are taking it section by section, right? And the first one, uh, you know what? Let's all just read this together, okay? Let's read the whole thing. You ready? I know it's, it's small, but I didn't wanna <coughs> switch slides, okay? So here we go. I believe in God... Hold on. Get out your glasses if you need them. I'll give you some time. I'm just kidding. Here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Christian faith, the Christian doctrine, in a very succinct sort of way, but very depth, very deep in meaning and what we are called to and, and what a Christian life looks like. And we've been taking this uh, section by section where we've so far gone through, you know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And now we're at this point of saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord. Where's my son? Carter, come here. I'm not gonna embarrass him. Here we go, come here. This? <laughs> this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. What can you gain from that statement? What is something that you can understand? As I stand here, I'm with my son, and I say, this is my dearly loved son, in whom I'm well pleased. What do you get? What, what are some of the things beyond that simple statement that you can understand about him, about me, and about our relationship? Love. Ready, go. What? Love. Love. Proud. What? Proud. Proud. What else? Connection. Connection. Respect. Respect. He's a good boy. He is. He is. <laughs> what else? He, I, he's a little bit embarrassed. Okay, but that's my fault, right? Go ahead and sign a seat. Okay. Thank you. Good job, Carter. What else? Okay, when I present my son to you and I say, this is my dearly loved son in whom I'm well pleased, what does that tell you about him and me, about maybe just him because of me? What, what does that speak to you? We have relationship. What else? What? I want to keep him. He's mine forever. Anything else? Approval, I appro- I'm approving of him, absolutely. Now, when Jesus was here, the time came for him to begin his ministry. And one of the way- things that signified the beginning of his ministry is he went to John the Baptist, who had been baptizing people, which is why he was known as John the Baptist. He had been baptizing people and he was waiting for the Messiah to come. Jesus shows up and says, 
I want you to baptize me. Sort of as a physical signal of, it begins, right? We're starting. And John goes, no, 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 I, I, I should not be baptizing you. And Jesus goes, quit overthinking it. Just baptize me. This is going to be the beginning. And John baptizes him. And in Matthew 3, 16, it says this. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. So not only do we have an incredible picture of the Trinity right there, which is a whole nother series that we've already been through down here, but it, it gives us a glimpse of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, their interaction, their three in one, all of these things. But this declaration of God saying, this is who Jesus is. Not just a prophet, not just a good guy, not just somebody who has a better beard than everybody else. This <laughs> is my son. Not only is he my son, but he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. Which means whatever he says, whatever he does, this is for you. For us here this morning, 2,000 years later, what Jesus said, what Jesus did is for us. For us here right now. This was the purpose of him coming. And so a question that we want to walk through in the next few minutes is, what do Christians believe about Jesus? The declaration is, we believe in Jesus, the Son of God. And we see this declaration from God saying, this is my son. He's different than Moses, than Abraham, than Isaiah, than John. See, a bunch of people were looking at John, weren't they? So they're looking at John going, are you, are you? No, 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 he's still coming. God says, this is the Messiah. This is my son. So pay attention to what he does and what he says. So what do Christians believe about Jesus? This is important. This is the foundation of our faith. What we believe about Jesus is a deal breaker. So we want to wrap our heads around what, what do we believe about Jesus? So first off, he was there in the beginning. Jesus was not something that was invented. Jesus was not someone who was created. He was there in the beginning. In John 1, it says, in the beginning was what? The Word. The word. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm never saying anything out loud again. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was? God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus was not invented, he was not created. The Greek word for word, here in the beginning was the Word, is logos, or logos, right? And the meaning of that is reason or plan. Get this. In the beginning was Jesus. He has always been the reason. He has always been the plan of bringing us back to God. It was not plan. Jesus was not plan B. Jesus wasn't once Adam and Eve messed up. God went, oh, ah, ah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a couple thousand years to come up with something. Uh, and then, uh, you know, once it got to, you know, BC had been around a while and it's like, oh, we should change it up. Zero. And okay, okay, I'll send Jesus. In the beginning was the word. Jesus was always the reason. He was always the plan of bringing people back to, him, back to God. Of saving people, giving people the opportunity to have relationship with God. He's always been there. He's always been the plan. He's always been the reason. In the beginning was Jesus. Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. This is who we believe Jesus to be. This is what a Christian puts their faith in. This is what distinguishes a Christian believer from other faiths, from other religions and who they say Jesus is. Jesus is God. And he was there from the beginning. He was the action and proof of God's love and desire for relationship with us. How many of you in this room at some point in your life have wondered whether God loves you? Wondered whether God cares? Wonder whether God's forgotten about you? Wonder whether you're important to God or not? Each one of us in some way have or will at some point cry out to God and go, God, where are you? I thought you loved me. I've been to church. A lot. 
I have several Bibles. <laughs> right? What happened? And we need to understand that Jesus is the evidence, the eternal evidence and proof of God's love for you, for me. He is the evidence. He's the proof of God's desire for relationship. He is the proof that God didn't say, let there be this, let there be that, let me, okay, earth. Good luck. <laughs> Jesus is the proof of that. Jesus is the evidence of God's desire for relationship with us. He is the action that we needed to take place to assure us. I mean, and did it, he, he could have just done this theologically. He, he could have just been like, I love you, just trust me. But instead, he put skin on it. I remember as a little kid, I always hated it when my parents went to bed before I got to sleep. I hated it. I would be laying there in bed and all of a sudden I'd see the hall light go off. Everything would get quiet and I'm like, oh no. Because everybody knows once the parents go to bed is when the refrigerator comes to life. And it's going to make sounds as it comes down the hall at you and it will eat you. And so the only defense you have is your sheet. Right? Anybody? Yes? So I would lay there. I remember, I have these memories as a little kid and I'd just be like, huh, and I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm imagining people crawling through the window and out the air conditioning vents and, and I would go, mom. Now my parents' bedroom was like caddy corner to mine. So they're like a total of 19 feet from me. And my mom or dad would be like, what? Help! <laughs> they're like, you're okay. Right, parents? Yeah? <laughs> you're fine. And I don't think I'm fine. <laughs> Need assistance. And Typically, it was my mom who would come into my room, she would sit down on my bed, and she would rub my back until I went to sleep. Aww. Something my wife now hates her for. <laughs> and she would, she put skin on it. I knew they cared. I knew they were there. I knew they were just in the other room. The, I mean, theoretically, I knew that all this would do. I knew the refrigerator wasn't, but in the moment, I needed something with skin. I needed someone to, to come and be with me. God looks down at humanity and goes, I see all the sacrifices. I see all the ways that you're trying to follow God and you're trying to discover who I am here. And he comes walking in the room. He sat on the bed and he rubs our back. And he assures us he's here. Jesus is the evidence, the proof of God's desire for a relationship with us. It's not just, you're fine, go to sleep. There are those moments when it feels that way. When we get into the dark night of the soul and we wonder what's going on and what God's doing. But Jesus was the evidence. He was the proof of God's presence and God's desire to be with us. God knew we needed that and he put skin on John 1.14. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus came as the physical demonstration of God's love for us, of God's presence for us, that now lives in his Holy Spirit in the lives of anybody who puts their faith in Jesus. This was the proof of God. What do Christians believe about Jesus? We can know God as we know him. We can know God as we look at Jesus, right? The people saw Jesus physically. I mean, the people back then, they were, I mean, he was right in front of them. And I love this. Whenever I get into this mindset, I was like, well, if God would just show himself to me. Well, then I wouldn't have any problem with faith. These people saw Jesus. They saw him walk up to a guy, spit in the dirt, rub it in his eyes, and all of a sudden he could see again. They saw, let's go back a little further. The children of Israel saw God, pillars of fire, whole cities crumbling down. 
They saw God moving physically. And yet they were like, oh God, why hast thou forsaken us and forgotten all about us? The people saw Jesus and they would ask him, are you the Messiah? And Jesus goes, you don't know me because you're not willing, you're not willing to follow me. You're not willing to commit and go, you know what? I know this takes some faith. I know that all this doesn't make sense. I know that I don't have all the answers, but you know what? I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to trust that you are who you say you are, that you're going to do what you'll say you're do, you'll do, and I'm going to follow you. Jesus goes, unless, unless you're willing to do that, until you're ready to do that, you're going to keep looking around going, go on, go on, anyone? Messiah, are you the Messiah? And we're going to continue to be lost. How easy is it for us to miss the evidence of God in our life because it doesn't look how we want it to look. It doesn't look how we expect it to look. God doesn't move in the timing that we want him to move. He doesn't move in the exact way. And so we continue to look around and go, God, God, why? Right? It's easy for us to do and we've all done it. Jesus says we can know God as we look at him and look at what, at what he did. When Jesus appeared to James, um, I'm sorry, not James, when Jesus appeared to Thomas, um, Thomas was having a hard time believing. And when Jesus appeared to him, Thomas goes, oh, my Lord, my God. You know what Jesus did not do at that point? He did not go, no, 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 not God, not God. I'm, I'm Jesus. Just, just, just Jesus. He didn't correct Thomas. Thomas declares, my Lord, my God. And Jesus moved right on. He, rec he saw that Thomas recognized him accurately, but guess what? Even the disciples didn't get it. The disciples, these guys who had left their families, had left their homes, had left their jobs, had done all these things to follow Jesus, even they didn't get it. There's a point in John 14 where Philip goes, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. He was just like us. He goes, just, just show us God and then we'll be satisfied. And Jesus, if you want to know if Jesus was a patient, compassionate guy, watch this interaction with Philip and his disciples. Because Jesus goes, Philip, love you, man. I've been with you all this time. You've seen all these things. And yet, you keep asking. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The things that I do, this is evidence of the Father. Why are you asking me to show, show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak aren't my own, but my Father who lives in me, who does this work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least, and get, I love this, Jesus makes it real, or at least believe in the things that you see. He knows we're physical people. He knows that we like proof and evidence and we want to be able to touch, feel, hear, taste, smell. He, he knows that. Jesus goes, look, if you are still wrestling in faith of believing in what is not seen, look at what's seen. And again, we can look back at Jesus and go, he was the evidence of God's existence his power and his presence with us. And Jesus goes, look at what I've done. Look at what I'm doing and you'll see. In what ways are you personally missing the evidence of God? In what ways are you dismissing the things of God because it's, oh, well, you know, yeah. I got an unexpected check in the mail, but it wasn't like for a million dollars or anything. Well, yeah, some friends came over and, and they helped us out because, you know, I was sick. And, and so, but I mean, I mean, it, I mean, they're just friends. I mean, that, that was nice, but it's just, in what ways are we dismissing the work of God, the evidence of God, the proof of God, and still looking around and going, God, God, show yourself to me. Yeah, 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 yeah I know, I know. There's a clever little story of a guy who's driving around the mall and he's looking for a parking spot and he's just doing laps. I mean, and he's getting more, more frustrated. And finally he goes, God, 
if you will just help me get a parking space, I'll go back to church. All of a sudden, right in front of him, a car begins to back out. And the guy goes, oh, never mind, God, I got one. In what ways do we dismiss things that God is doing in our lives because it doesn't look how we want it to look or think it should look or, or it's not that big a deal? Or... And God is demonstrating his love to us. We can know God as we see Jesus and see who Jesus was and what he did. And Jesus is the forgiveness of our sin. Sin is any way that we live against God. Basically, that's what sin is. And in 1 John 2, 1, it says this, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, someone who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sin, that makes right for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. This is what we believe about Jesus. Without him, it would be up to you. Anybody in a position right now in your life where you're like, I'm pretty sure I could attain righteousness? Anyone this morning feel like you could attain righteousness? Without Jesus, we say that without Jesus, it would be up to us. This is why you look at so many of the other religions in the world, all of the other religions in the world, where in some way it's shame-based. In some way, it's works-oriented. In some way, it's you, you have to go door to door and evangelize your faith in order to earn points in heaven, in order to make yourself right with God. You've got to go to the temple and you have to make sacrifices to the altars of the God so that you can be made right with him and so its wrath would not get... And it's all about you and what you have to do and, and the ways that you have to attain righteousness. We believe he is the forgiveness for our sin. That it is because of Jesus that we no longer have to bring up here, hey, good morning, everybody. Happy, mother, happy Mother's Day. Please bring over the goat. And end up with a big bloody stain on the carpet that Tim would never be able to get out. This is the reason that it is not about, hey, you, you better do this sacrifice at just the right time. You better provide this offering. You better not do this or do this or you will be cursed and separated from God for eternity. Guess what? That's what we deserve. But instead, Jesus came and said, you know what? I'm gonna take this. Anybody glad that Jesus came and took it? Anybody glad that it's not about you having to follow 613 Levitical laws and trying to figure out whether you're in good standing or not and then at some point, just to make sure, you have to go to a priest. You don't get to go to God. You don't get to pray. You don't get to worship of your own accord. You have to go to the high priest. The high priest goes into this back room behind a big curtain. You see kind of like puffs of smoke come up out of the roof every now and then and he has to intercede for you because you're not worthy. Guess what? You're worthy. Through your faith in Jesus, you are worthy. You are made righteous. You are able to go directly to God because of Jesus. He was the evidence of God's desire for that kind of relationship. Jesus is the forgiveness of our sin. Through Jesus, you are seen as perfect, not because you are perfect but because through Jesus, God sees past your sin, past the ways that you have lived against him. Now, he calls you away from that sin. He says, don't keep doing that because it's not gonna bring you life. It's gonna kill you. It's gonna destroy your relationship with him. But you are forgiven through Jesus. You are made right through Christ. And the last one. He is the only way to the Father. Jesus is the only way to the Father. John 14 says this, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. Our culture hates this. This is one of the biggest issues that people have with the Christian faith. 
Because it is much easier, it's much more convenient, it's much more tolerant, it's much more inviting to say, hey, all roads lead to heaven. Guess what? I agree with that. All roads lead to heaven. But Jesus is standing there and he decides who goes in. Because we are, uh, humanity, we were created. Whether you're a believer or not, you were created in the image of God. So everyone's soul is searching for something. Even the atheist who says, no, I don't believe in any of this. I don't. There, there is a longing for more. A longing for meaning. And in this, we need to come to an understanding that it is only through Jesus. Not because you're good enough. Not because you earned it. Not because you deserve it. But it is only because of Jesus that we have the opportunity to be with God for the rest of eternity rather than allowing our sin to separate us from God for eternity. But even so, we can get into this thinking and maybe the people around us get into this thinking that we're always searching and expecting there to be some way for us to earn our way into God's presence. That's the reason some people come to church. It's the reason some people come to church on Easter and Christmas. Somehow that's the standard. And it's like, okay, well, this will get me enough points. And, the, and, and I believe that a lot of people are sincere in that. But there's this tendency to think that, oh, well, if I do this, then God will, you know, give me a, a little extra favor. God will, God will make things happen for me. Oh, God. It is only through Jesus Paul and Silas were in prison and miraculously there was an earthquake that jail doors burst open and the guard who had, been, who had heard Paul and Silas worshiping, he had heard them crying out to God. He goes to them and recognizes this is not an earthquake. This, this is something bigger. This means something for my life. And he goes to them and he goes, how do I be saved? This is probably a guy who did the religious stuff. This is probably the guy who was a decent human being. He went to work every day. He was a guard. He tried to do what he was supposed to do. And yet he knew it wasn't enough. And in the face of an opportunity with God, he took it. And he goes to them, he goes, how can I be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And go to church every week, right? And make sure I have a quiet time for at least 30 minutes every morning. Make sure I go to youth group. Make sure if I cuss, I say sorry. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You and your whole family. You know what he did? Ran back and got his family. Ran back and went, we got it. We've, we've been missing it. It's because of Jesus. And they put their faith in Jesus. We are all in different places here this morning. We've all got different stuff going on. I'm sure that there are some in this room who you've never felt closer to God. And you're just like, oh, I'm seeing the evidence of God. And I'm having no problem <laughs> with believing that God is here and he's moving. I'm sure that there are people in this room you are really good at looking Christian. You go to church, you've got the Christian routine down, you talk like a Christian, act like a Christian, you've got the Christian bumper stickers, you've got your, your, your Exit 83 stuff, and it looks good. But you're bored. Because it's just religion. And I'm sure that there are people here this morning where you're going, I don't even know anymore. I don't know what to believe. And each one of us, see, the invitation to a relationship with God didn't end when Jesus ascended to heaven. It wasn't like, well, world, you had your chance. Right here, right now, this morning, the Holy Spirit is offered to each one of us to move in power, to bring joy to the areas of your life that are joyless, to bring hope where you stopped praying long ago to bring peace where it's just been utter chaos. 
How will you respond in the face of Jesus? In the face of who Jesus is, who he promised to be, what he promised through a relationship with him, what will you say to that? How will you respond? And God doesn't, and God doesn't want it just to be the, Jesus! Because that's the religious thing to do. He wants a relationship with us. That's why he came. That's why he demonstrated it so practically and so visibly. So God, right now, I pray over every soul in this room, wherever they're at, whether it's in a place of tremendous life where you are just pouring out your, your presence and your spirit and you're just working in powerful ways or on the other end where life is really hard and there's lots of questions and there's lots of doubt and, and it's dark. God, help us in our belief and help us in our unbelief. Help us when we've got questions and when we're afraid and when we have doubts to run at you. To cry out to you and to surrender to you and to allow you and invite you to do your work. God, I pray that you would bring miraculous healing to families. I pray over those here this morning where Mother's Day isn't a great day. Mother's Day is a reminder of hurt or of loss. And I pray that you would bring peace and hope today. Lord, I pray for the mother and child relationships represented in this room. God, that you would bring unity, that you would bring healing where there's been hurt, that you would bring life where there's been struggle but God, that it wouldn't come from them trying harder or making up their minds to not fight for the rest of the afternoon, but God, that it would be a, a, a miracle. God, it would be you moving in lives and changing lives because Jesus, I am so thankful that you came and did what you did and that it was such visible evidence of your love and your presence and your promise for us. So go with us today and throughout our week, that we would seek you, that we would surrender to you, and we would allow you to move in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.